in case you're here and don't know where you are. I don't know about y'all folks, but church is on the short list of places that I like to go. <laughs> Ain't just this. I, if I never make, went back to Walmart, man, that'd be a blessing, wouldn't it? I'm thankful for a job, but man, I don't like going to work. I, it's just... If I could financially never have to go back, well, I wouldn't be grinning like a mule eating briar. But I like to come down to the church house. Man, I like God's people. I like the spirit. I like the singing. I asked Brittany for service. I said, can y'all sing a couple? She said, two or three? I said, a couple. She said, a couple's two and a few's three. I said, well, Aaron said a few's about six or seven, but we're going to go with a couple tonight. So, so shout out to my buddy Aaron on the highway. Welcome back to church. Man, I like the church house. Some of the, the best things that ever happened to me happened down at the church house. Amen. Now, I got saved at my house, but I couldn't wait to get to the church house and tell somebody knew something about it. Thank God for the church house. Proverbs chapter 22 tonight. Got a message. I believe it'll be helpful. That's the intent and purpose. I hope it will be. If not, it's my fault. It's not the Lord's fault. So just shove it on me. Amen. Proverbs chapter 22. Got one verse tonight. It's kind of a jumping off verse. We'll see what the Lord has to say. Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 29. The Bible says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Brother Nolan Johnson, would you pray for us, brother? Help us here tonight, Lord God. Touch us, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Be with us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Thank you, 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 Lord. Title message is Diligence, a Key to Success. We want to be successful, don't we? And you want to be successful at your business or your job, and we want to be successful with husbands and wives and fathers and mothers, and we want our family to be successful, and not necessarily the way the world measures success, but the way God measures success. Amen. We want to be a success in our life for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that takes diligence. A diligent man, the Bible says, a man diligent in his business will stand before kings. He'll deal with kings. A man that's diligent in his business won't have to deal with the crooked thieves of this world. Now, diligent means to be steady in application. To be constant in exertion. You ever seen anybody, they just go 100 miles an hour and they're wide open and then they sit around for a week and don't do nothing. Just burst. Y'all know anybody like that? I know people like that. Just burst and they get great things done and then they might not do nothing. That's not diligent. Diligent is always on the ball. Always constant. Always up front about things. Not idle, attentive to detail. I am very attentive to details when I care about it. If I don't care about it, brother, that thing is not on my radar. They haven't got the round radar on the movies. It ain't nowhere on my radar if I don't care about it. Maybe I should be. Diligent is attentive, not idle. A businessman that's diligent will be successful. A diligent businessman or woman knows how to take care of their business. They're not slothful. They're about their business, no matter what the business is. Maybe you work for someone else at a job. You work with people, and some people are very good at their job, and they're diligent, 
and they're always on the ball and doing what they shouldn't be doing. Then you work with some people, and you are like, they are killing me. I work with anybody like that. They just cause you heartache and trouble because they're not diligent in their business. Or maybe you own your business. Always on top of things. Doing what needs to be done. He sees people and they're trying to operate a business. You know, when you call them and you try to get a hold of them and you can't get a hold of them. Then they tell you four times they're going to be there and they don't show up. And it takes them to come three times to look at a job to get a quote. Then the quote's wrong. They tell you they're going to start a job four times before they start it. And they give you a date when it's going to be finished and it's never finished on time. You know what that is? That's a person who's not diligent at their business. And a person like that will never be successful at a business or a job or anything else. wonder why people bounce around the jobs like they do. Some of them are just so slothful and not diligent that they can't keep a job. You can't advance. We're talking about diligence tonight. A man that's diligent at his business is going to succeed. Now, I thought about the Apostle Paul. He was diligent at his business, and I'm not talking about tent making. I'm sure he was a great tent maker. I'm sure he was. But his business was the gospel. And the Apostle Paul was diligent about his business. Wherever he went, whoever he talked to, that man was giving the gospel to somebody. He was diligent about his business. He stood before kings, didn't he? That's what Jesus told him he was going to do in the book of Acts. He stood before Agrippa and talked to King Agrippa. Gave him the gospel, told him he needed to be saved. He appealed to Caesar and went to Rome. I believe he stood before Caesar. I thought about Mordecai. We've been talking a lot about Mordecai late on Wednesday night, haven't we? Mordecai was a diligent man. He was at his post. He was at his position. He was taking care of his business. He wasn't taking care of everybody else's business. You ever seen anybody that they can take care of everybody else's business pretty good, but their business is always a constant mess? No, that's not a diligent person. Mordecai was taking care of his business. He was in the king's gate. He heard something. Someone was going to try to harm the king. He reported it. The king's life was saved. And it wound up saving a whole bunch of people's lives, didn't it? Amen. Why? Because he was a diligent man. Diligent. Be diligent at your job. That, that'll just help you in life. Show up on time. Be there when you're supposed to be there. Work when you're supposed to be working. Diligence. A diligent person's never lacking, never slothful, not caught off guard. They're anticipating. Diligent, alert. Diligence is a key to success. Now, diligence is not a gift. God gave gifts. That's what the Bible says. He gave gifts. Diligence is not a gift. It's something we do ourselves. Now the good thing about that is everybody can be diligent. Little children can be diligent. Adults can be diligent. Older people can be diligent. Everyone can, everybody can't sing. That's a gift. Whether you use it for the Lord or you use it for the devil, it is a gift that somebody gave you besides yourself. They did not, you did not put them pipes down in your throat that sound good. Mine sounds like a bullfrog croaking, amen? I don't have the gift. That's a gift. Everybody can't sing. Everybody's not going to be a great preacher. Everybody's not going to have every gift, but everyone can be diligent. Everyone. The little children, that's what we try to teach little children, isn't it? to be diligent. Pick it up. Pick it up. Pow! Pick it up. <laughs> Teaching the little children to be diligent because before long, they're going to have to go out this whole world, aren't they? Right. 
And they're going to have, they're going to have families and husbands and wives and have jobs and have their own children. And if they're not diligent, they're not going to be successful in this world. Amen. That's what we try to teach to little children. Be diligent. Everyone can be diligent. And the thing is, someone can be a great craftsman and not necessarily a successful businessman. I've heard people say, well, so-and-so's, I know a guy, he ran a company, he put in uh, water lines and sewer lines and stuff for big subdivisions in Weddington, Charlotte area. He was telling me about a guy that was uh, operated his, one of his tracos. He said, that guy's the best I've ever seen. He said he broke his arms one time and said he could run that thing better with his feet than some men could with his hands. And the man showed up, he said, I got to work, I'm going to starve to death. And you think, how could you be the best at something and not be a successful businessman? It could be that he just didn't want to be. But some people are great craftsmen, but they're not diligent, right? They can't show up at work. They got a drinking problem. The best painters I know, all of them drink. They got an issue, right? The best painters. You can be a great craftsman and not be a successful businessman if you're not Diligent. Diligence is something we can all do. It's not a gift. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Let me show you a couple verses of scripture. Diligence. We should be diligent. Diligent. And we're going to be successful for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this world we're going to have to be diligent Christians, steady, anticipating, always about the Lord's business. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Thank God. God did some stuff, didn't he? He gave us promises, we've escaped the love, he saved our soul. Look at verse 5. And besides this, the things that God did, look what he says. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. And there's a list of things there, isn't it? So God gave us great promises, he saved our soul, and then the apostle Peter says, besides these things God done, you need to be diligent to add some things to your faith. Diligent. Us, we need to be diligent about our walk. We can add these things that goes on virtue and knowledge. We can be diligent and add these things that will help us be successful for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can tell you tonight, our business is men and women and children. Our business is as born-again Christians, our business is souls. You can make your living all kind of different ways, but no matter what you do to earn a living, your business is people's souls. All born-again people should be trying to win souls and tell people about Jesus Christ that they might be born again. We should want to be successful for the Lord when it comes to our witness. And that is takes diligence. We want to live a successful life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And who doesn't? Who doesn't? Who doesn't want to be successful for the Lord? Who, who wants to lay on their deathbed if we get in one and say, Lord, I wish I'd done so and so, and Lord, I wish I'd have put more time, and Lord, I would have. That, that's not the kind of ending we want, is it? We want to, if it comes down to that end, we want to better say, Lord, I had faults, I had failures, but thank God you allowed me to do some things in your name. It's the kind of ending we want. Paul said it came down to his ending. Paul said he had kept the faith. Did Paul make mistakes? Absolutely. Are you going to make mistakes? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean we can't be diligent in our life and that we can keep the faith and finish our course also. But if we're going to finish our course well, it's going to take diligence. We're not going to 
live a sloppy, slothful life and finish our course well. It's not going to happen. So I want to take a look at some things that we can be diligent about that will help us in our life. Turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Let's look at the first one. Diligence is what I'm talking about tonight. Steady application. Not idle. Attentive to the things that God's called us to do. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. Look at verse number 23. Common verse, we hear it quoted right regular. Proverbs 4 and 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now what we should do as Christians, if we're going to be successful, diligently keep our heart. Because your heart is your life. What's in your heart is going to come out. What's in your heart is how you're going to behave and act and live. The problem with the heart is the heart of the problem. It's a heart issue. All things come from the heart, the Bible says. Matthew 15 and 19 says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, all these evil, wicked things, they don't start and come necessarily from here. It happens when they get into the heart. That's where they come from. Matthew 12 and 34, Jesus said, old generation of vipers. How'd you like to start a sermon off of that? <laughs> Bunch of stinking snakes. I go over like a lead balloon, won't it? Jesus said, old generation of vipers. How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If it's in there and you hang around somebody long enough, it's going to come out right here. Our heart tells the tale, doesn't it? Let somebody hang around a little bit and they come in flying high as an eagle. But you know what? If the heart's not right before long, they're going to fly right out that door and you won't see them no more. Why? It was in their heart. Are we diligent about what we put in to our hearts? How do you put something in your heart? Through the gates the pastor talked about the other night, right? And we've all heard it. For our heart is our life. Clean heart, clean life. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Hard to write a whole book off of that, ain't it? That's some good preaching, though. Preach on, preacher. Yeah. Clean heart, clean life. Dirty heart, dirty life. What's in your heart? Mine eye affecteth mine heart, what the Bible says. That's a biblical principle. What we put in our eyes, what we put in our ears, the things we touch, the places we go, and the things we do, all these things affect our heart. It is impossible to live in the filth of this world and take place of the filth of this world and separate it and it not affect your heart. Can't be done. The Bible says we should keep our hearts with all diligence. Turn to Job 31. Let me show you a verse. And this is one of them verses that's... I've heard this thing just butchered. Like the verse Galatians 2 and 20 this morning. You hear it quoted often, you very rarely hear it quoted right. Look at Job 31, verse number 1. Job 31 and 1, the Bible says, I made a covenant. Job 31 and 1. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? That's not what the Bible says, is it? You ever heard anybody say that? Man, I have. I made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I look upon a maid? That's not what the Bible says, is it? Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I think upon a maid? When it goes into the eyes, where's it going? It's going to here. Then where's it going after that? 
it's going to right here. That's what the Bible says. He didn't say, why should I look upon a maid? He said, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? You catch the connection there. What's going on here doesn't just stop. It'll eventually get down into our heart and come out in our life. That's why we should keep our heart with all diligence. Let me show you another one. This man knew some stuff too. Turn to Psalms 101. Psalms 101. Let me show you another one. Psalms 101. Psalms 101. It's a psalm of David. And David was a man after God's own heart. And da da David knew some stuff. And you know, you can learn some stuff through, through study and through prayer. But you can learn some stuff by making a stinking mess too, can't you? But if you make a mess in your life, and if you will let God help you, he can teach you some things even out of that mess. Look at Psalms 101 and verse number 3. David said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. And you say, well, he's a hypocrite because he looked on Bathsheba and all that stuff happened. Why do you think he knows he's not going to set any wicked thing before his eyes? The school of hard knocks, right? Sometimes when we go through some hard lessons and make some mistakes and get knocked down, that's when we can learn some lessons. That's when we learn why we need to guard our heart, keep our heart with all diligence. That's what we should be doing. You know, if we put in good, good's going into the heart, right? We have access in 2020. 2020 has been a stinking mess, hasn't it? Man, it's just been awful, man. But we have access to so much good at our fingertips. You can take your phone mine on me. You can take your Samsung God and dial that dude up and pull up good preaching from all over the world. That thing will help you. You know what that is? That's good going in. That's how you keep your heart, right? We got a little bookshelf out here. and You can get those books on that bookshelf and if you will read those books and follow those scripture references in those books, that, those books on that bookshelf will keep you busy for years. You know what that is? That's keeping your heart with all diligence. That's putting in the good that's going to help us be successful for the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, we should keep our heart, which is our life, with all diligence. Secondly, turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke Chapter number 15. So we see that we should keep our heart with all diligence. Luke chapter 15. Look at verse number 8. Luke 15 and 8, the Bible says, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels, and the angels of God over one sinner that come to repentance. That woman lost that coin. You know what she did? She diligently sought that coin, didn't she? She got her broom and she tore that house apart trying to find that, that, that lost coin. The question is, are we diligently seeking the lost? You know, I believe all of us are some of the time. 
Some of us are all the time. Some of us are kind of in the middle there. But somebody in our church is always requesting prayer for someone they've talked to, aren't they? I talked to so-and-so I work with, and I could just tell the Lord was dealing with their heart. Pray for my aunt. You know, I, I, I talked to her, and she's lost, and talked to her about the Lord, and it just looks like maybe the Lord's dealing with her heart. You know what that is? That's a group of people that worship together, diligently seeking lost people that they might be saved. Now, what, now how you diligently seek lost people? You look for them. It's easy to walk around this old world and smile at people, nod your head, and look right through people, isn't it? I do it. I'm sure you do it. I see people do it to me. They're smiling at me, and they're looking right through me, brother, like I am not even there. But when you diligently seek lost people, you pay attention to people, don't you? You listen to how people talk. You look for an opportunity to cut in there and give them a word. You look for an opportunity to give that track. I've seen little children just flat out just stick and track people, brother. They don't care what they think. Ain't nobody going to mean, no, mean to no youngin. The adult, we want if they're going to say something or how they're going to take it. Child don't care about that. They just straight up and bam, let me give you this track. They are diligently seeking that person. They may not even know what's going on, but are we diligently seeking the lost? Are we diligently seeking maybe those that are saved but they've gone astray? I was preparing this message today. I thought about a brother, and man, he's a friend of mine. I love him. I sent him a text while I was thinking about it, and I missed him. Are we diligently seeking those that have gone astray? Diligently, are they on our mind? Are they in our heart? Are we willing to tear things up to get a hold of them? That woman, she lost that coin, and she's, she's going to tear that house down to the ground. Like there was leprosy in the wall. I remember that in Leviticus 13 and 14. You scrape it and tear it down and break it down. She lost that coin, and she was willing to tear things up to find that lost coin. Are we willing to put ourselves out? Are we willing to inconvenience ourselves? You know, sometimes that's just what it takes. Sometimes it takes inconvenience to get a witness in. Sometimes you have to turn around and go back on the highway because you should have done it and you didn't. You know what that is. That's being disobedient, but that's also being diligent, amen. Are we diligently seeking the lost? Number three, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I said earlier that diligence is not a gift. We can all do it. The young and the old and everybody in between can be diligent. Now Romans chapter 12 does speak of gifts, right? This is one of the chapters. It speaks of the gift that God gives. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 6. The Bible says, Having these gifts differing according to the grace that is given us. Everybody has different gifts. God gives different gifts and he gives it all so that the body of Christ might be edified. Look at verse 6 again. It says, Having these gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. For the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth, now ruleth the gift, but look what the Holy Spirit said about it, he that ruleth with diligence. So the gift is the gift of ruling, but the person that has the gift is supposed to be diligent in their use of the gift. Are we diligently serving God? What's God giving you to do? Everybody's got something to do. Everyone. Well, who's God made you ruler over? Well, I ain't ruling over nobody. If you wife, you rule over your husband, amen. It's a joke. 
you're a man, you're married and got a family, you're the head of that household. If you're a woman, that house should be under your control, not the household, but the house. If you have children, you know what? You've got children that you are, have authority over and you are the ruler. Are we diligent about those type things? Do you have a Sunday school class full of snot-nosed little children? Wiping their nose and you know how they do. Are you diligent about that? Or is it the kind of thing we think about on the way to church Sunday morning? Have we prayed about them that week? Have we prayed about the lesson? Well, all they do was color the little turtles. So foundation's what that is. And it doesn't matter what it is or how big it looks or how small it looks in anyone else's eyes. If there's something that God's given us authority over, we need to be diligent about it. Whether it's 500 people or church or it's five kids in the nursery. Diligence. Are we diligent about, our, about serving God? We live in some tough times right now, don't we? And this COVID thing has got the ministry turned upside down and into figure four. Man, y'all remember the figure four? Y'all remember that? Rick Flair, you lock you up in the figure four, man, you was through. That's what the COVID has done. You know, we worked, worked with the young adults and it started last year and I was excited because they're young. Man, I'm old. I can't hardly do stuff and I'm fat and but we got some young legs, and we were going to go out and knock on these doors. And I was going to sit in the car and watch them, and, man, we were going to attract all of Richmond County. You know, whether you like it or not, that thing don't work nowadays. You're up and knock on somebody's door, and they're looking at you through the door, and they got three masks on and a gas mask, and they don't want that stuff. I believe in door-to-door -door visitation. I believe it works. But you know what? Right now, it's not an option. And the fact of the matter is, it might not never be an option again. Yeah. Tough times. What about prayer? The COVID can't affect prayer, can it? Now, we got the, the EDM cards going out soon. Every door direct mailer. Man, we got them dudes stacked up and banded up and boxed up. And I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well, if we do a Rockingham and Hamlet, there can't be much of the county left. I mean, there ain't nothing on the side of the racetrack but pine trees and fox squirrels, right? So I looked this morning, and if we get 2,900 more EDNs, we're sending out 17,000. If we only get 2,900, that'll be Every household in Richmond County will get one of those cards with scripture verses on the back and access to a video that tells people how to be saved. Amen. We're not going door to door knock. People don't want that. But they'll go check the mailbox. I wonder are we diligent in our service about praying over things like this? I can tell you where I've been with it. I'm going to confess. We don't have to get in a booth to confess, do we? I have included these things in my prayers. But including something in your prayers is not being diligent about it, is it? It's not being at the forefront of my mind. It's not being at the forefront of my heart. I hadn't put the effort and the prayers into it that I believe is pleasing to God. You say, what's the card going to do? You know, it might change somebody's life. That's what the gospel does. These people in this county, I read about a little boy this week and we kind of watched the Bozeman News. He was in West Yellowstone and two of your little boy and everybody in the house was abusing him and well, finally died from the abuse. And West Yellowstone's a rough place, man. You can't get in and out in the winter. And you know, and I just thought, when I was just reading that, and it breaks my heart, something like that, I thought, 
did he ever have a chance to hear the gospel? You know what? If that boy never had a chance, God, God's a just God, right? We know that. But could the gospel have changed that household? Sometimes that's the only thing that's going to change something is the gospel. Sometimes the social programs won't work and all the checks that we get won't work and all the police won't work. Sometimes the only thing that'll work is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It still has that power. I wonder are we diligent about praying over things like this EDM card, EDDM card. That's our service to God. Man, these people in abusive relationships right now, domestic violence in our county. Her children facing things. You know, we, me and Brooks used to go down to these apartments down here in Hamlet, down in the bottom. And you'd walk up and there'd be people with kids all around. They'd be smoking marijuana with the kids right there. Drinking liquor. And if that's going on on the outside, What's going on on the inside? There are people, there are children that if something don't change, they won't be here next year. Amen. That's how serious the matter it is. And we can't get in, and we can't get into the house, and we can't make people, but if that card gets in, and God touches somebody's heart, somebody's heart, with that gospel message, things can change. Folks, we got to be diligent. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. It's coming to a close soon. Hebrews chapter number 11. I remember when that pastor preached that series of messages about the different types of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Man, that was a stinking blessing, wasn't it? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek are we diligently seeking God in our daily life? Amen. Now that's a little more than coming to church when the doors is open, right? Man, that, to me, that is, that's a no-brainer, man. That's, that, that's the fun stuff, right? We forever want something, forever need something. And God said we can go to Him with our wants and our needs. That's what he said. That's what he wants from his children. What father doesn't want to hear from his child when they have a desire or a need? But do we seek him even when we don't need anything? How do we seek him even when the bills are paid and everybody's healthy and the COVID's gone? Is the desire to hear from God and know Him as strong when we don't have a dire need as it is when we do? You know what our tendency is? When things get thick and that need gets dire, we will get serious about seeking God. We'll get diligent about it, won't we? We won't have to write a note to remind ourselves to pray, will we? Why? Because it's right here. It's right here. Diligently. Do you diligently, do we as God's people, diligently seek God in prayer? 1 John 5 says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. You hear that? If you ask something according to the will of God, he hears us. And if we know that He hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. 
do we diligently seek God in prayer? What are ways he can be found? Do we diligently seek God in the book? Well, that's God speaking to man. You know, this is me speaking to you, right? And I know God can use a preacher. I understand all that. And we preach in the book. I understand that. But when you read this, this is God's book. This old King James Bible are God's words. The quiet of the morning. When we get up before everybody else. And things are still. They haven't begun yet. God speaks. That's a good time, isn't it? Do we diligently seek God in our worship? I know you can worship God anywhere, and we should, but we come here corporately as God's children to come together like he said and to worship. This is a great place to come expecting. You see a woman is 11 months pregnant. I don't know how that women be. Oh, she's been pregnant about three years, poor woman. What do we say? She's expecting. Something's about to go down soon, isn't it? No doubt about it. Something's going to happen. We know that, don't we? This is a great place when we come to worship to come expecting God to do something great. And according to that verse, if we will diligently seek him, he will reward us. He is the rewarder of them. That's why some people have more peace. Why some people have more joy. Why some people just seem like God's always working in their life. God didn't put everybody in a hat and pull it out like we do the birthday money. Brother Tim, he never won that, man. But if you diligently seek God, he'll reward you. That's what the Bible says. A verse tonight says, A man that's diligent in his business will stand before kings. He won't stand before mean men. He'll be successful. Turn to Romans chapter 14. We're going to close. Have a time of prayer if anyone needs to pray. Romans chapter 14. Man, this diligent in his business, the Bible says he is going to stand before kings. Look at Romans chapter 14. Look at verse number 10. Romans 14 and 10, and this is one of the three places that mention the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 3, and right here. Verse number 10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. This is saved people now. This isn't lost people. Saved people stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. I'll tell you something to try to help you, and I've been studying on this and thinking on it myself. Whether you're diligent or not, you're going to stand before the king one day. Amen. Whether you're diligent in your service Diligent in your life or whether you're not, we all as saved people, children of God, are going to stand before the one that hung on that cross and died for us and give account of our life the way we've lived our life. You know the desire of parents and grandparents and Sunday school teachers and preachers, people that are spiritual leaders, our desire is that you're able to stand before a holy God one day and give a good account of your life. That's our desire. And we're never going to be able to do that 
were not diligent. Hands bowed and eyes closed. Hands bowed and eyes closed. We're just going to take a minute. If you need to come pray, the altar is open. The Lord knows we need help.